Welcome, everyone. I'm Grace Ferrari, Senior Manager of Education and Support at Parkinson Canada. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on voice and communication, therapies in Parkinson's disease, evidence, timing, and techniques. I would like to take this opportunity to inform everyone that today's session is being recorded for future viewing and can be accessed by visiting our website at www.parkinson.ca. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping points to review. For technical support at any time during today's webinar, please call toll-free 1-888-777-7965 or email webcast at resolvecollaboration.com. Both contacts can be easily found at the bottom of your screen. You will have an opportunity to ask questions at any point during today's session. You can submit a question from your computer screen by clicking on the Ask a Question button and type your question. Every effort will be made to answer all questions, and we ask that your questions are of a general nature and not seeking medical advice. And now I'd like to provide a brief introduction to our presenter, Angela Roberts. Dr. Roberts is a Principal Investigator of Northwestern University Language and Communication in Aging and Neurodegeneration Research Group and Assistant Professor in the Roxland and Richard Pepper Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders in Evanston, Illinois. She has been a practicing speech-language pathologist for over 20 years. Dr. Roberts holds an adjunct research faculty appointment at the University of Western Ontario and is an investigator on the Ontario Neurodegenerative Diseases Research Initiative. Her research focuses on language and communication challenges in aging and er neurodegenerative disorders, specifically Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and frontal temporal lobral degeneration. Her research seeks to characterize the symptoms, presentations of communication impairments in these disorders, to understand the theoretical and brain disruptions that explain these disruptions, and to use this information to develop and to evaluate diet-based education and therapy programs that address these life-impacting impairments. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Grace. It's great to be on this webinar with all of you today. So just a brief introduction for those of you that I've had the opportunity to meet previously. Uh, my academic position in my lab has changed uh, to Northwestern University in Evanston, but I still maintain very strong Canadian ties. And as a Canadian, it's great to be with a Canadian audience today. Um, I'm going to start just by giving a bit of a framework for what we will be talking about on the webinar, which really is this concept of the interactive processes of communication. When we think about communicating our ideas or understanding the ideas that are communicated by others, we use multiple modalities, and these include our speech, uh, the movement of our tongue and jaw in order to produce speech sounds, voice, the use of our larynx and our respiratory system in order to produce uh, a uh, pleasant voice, a voice that's sufficiently loud enough, and a voice that has the variety that allows us to communicate uh, information with words as well as information with changes in pitch and tone. Our language is one of the most critical components of what makes us human, and it really is our ability to put our words into sentences and sentences into conversations that communicate our thoughts and our ideas. But when we communicate, we also use our memory processes, we use our attention processes, and most importantly, while we may not all be always good listeners, our hearing and our listening skills are critical to communication. What's really interesting in Parkinson's disease is over the last decade, we've discovered that all of these modalities can be affected by Parkinson's disease, that this is really a whole brain disorder that affects not only movement, but affects all aspects of speech and thinking. Our new research even indicates that it may affect hearing, and my own research focuses on how it impacts language. So today's format is really to go over several of the hot topics 
those hot topics that are coming up frequently and being asked by people with Parkinson's disease, but also those new areas of research in Parkinson's disease relative to this increased knowledge about the whole brain impact of Parkinson's disease on communication processes. Now, we've been doing speech and voice therapy in Parkinson's disease for a long time. We've had well-developed interventions for speech and voice for almost two decades now uh, in the area of Parkinson's disease. But what we haven't had to date and what is really a new hot aspect in the, the research in Parkinson's disease is the ability to use animal models of Parkinson's disease to actually understand how PD changes not only the brain's communication with the muscles that we use in producing voice, but also how we can vary components of treatment, intensity, how early do we need to begin treatment, and really for us to understand these concepts in any depth, we can do that more efficiently and more effectively when we have an animal model to study that in. So we've been using animals to understand Parkinson's disease and the impact of medications and walking and movement for many, many decades now. But what we haven't had is a way of looking at voice and speech processes uh, to any substantial degree in our animal models of Parkinson's. So Michelle Chucci's lab at the University of Wisconsin over the last couple of years has perfected a way of actually studying voice and speech uh, in rats. Now this isn't a movie, the rats aren't necessarily talking, but they're talking in the way that they communicate with one another using ultrasonic vocalizations. And what Michelle has been taking is a pink one model, so one of our well-known, well-established models of a rodent model of Parkinson's disease. And when we have these animal models, the, the models themselves or the animals are actually modified genetically so that they express Parkinson's disease, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, uh, and the brain changes that are associated with Parkinson's disease. So she's taken this model of Parkinson's, She's actually gone through trying to understand how these rodents communicate with one another along the parameters that are important to humans, such as changes in voice frequency or pitch, changes in loudness, changes in the variety of vocalizations that these animals are able to make. And then she studies them as they develop Parkinson's disease. And she's also developed some really novel ways of teaching them behaviors that simulate part of what we do in voice therapy. And so by training these animals to actually do therapy, she's beginning to understand more about the best timing of when to begin voice and speech therapy and also the types of exercises and the intensity that's required in terms of the amount of work that we should be investing in those exercises relative to making improvements. And so I've put up there just a tiny little bit of her data. So what you see in the figure in the middle of the slide next to the letter A, is normal voice patterns. So that's the normal kind of pitch changes that you hear in the voice of these rodents before they have Parkinson's disease. And what you see in figure B is after they develop Parkinson's disease. And so this would be equivalent to the changes that we hear when people develop uh, PD. And we hear their voices become quieter. Uh, their voices may not uh, be as variable. Their voice may become more flat. You may lose some of your singing or your speaking range. And this is what we see in the animal model as well. These rodents lose some of the quality or the richness to their voice. And what you see next to letter C is actually what happens after she puts them through a treatment protocol. And what you see is the pattern, the voice pattern that we see by letter C looks a lot more like the voice pattern in normal animals before they have Parkinson's disease, which is beside letter A. And so Michelle's really been working toward helping us to understand what is important, what are the key components that are required to have a successful program for voice and speech rehabilitation in PD. And a couple of facts have emerged from this work, as well as what we know from our human work. And one of those is that if we want speech to be better, then we need to train the muscles that are involved in producing speech sounds, such as the tongue, and the jaw. But if we want voice to be louder, then we actually need to train those muscles that are involved in producing voice, the muscles of the respiratory system and those muscles that are used to help to close and to operate the vocal cords. 
We will not get good carryover if we train the tongue relative to voice loudness, nor will we likely improve articulation to a substantial, substantial degree or speech sound clarity if we train the vocal cords. So this notion of training the specific muscle groups has become quite clear from our animal models. What's also become very clear is that training intensity matters. So for us to improve speech and voice in Parkinson's disease, we have to do a lot of therapy, and we have to do it in a very concentrated way. And practice becomes really important. So for gains to be made in speech and voice therapy and for them to be maintained after we stop uh, participating in therapy, it requires daily practice and use of your voice at least several hours of the day, either in conversation or in practice activities. Michelle's work, and we don't have evidence yet in the human model for this, but what the animal models are telling us is that the earlier we start therapy for speech and voice, it's possible the better outcomes that we will have. So what tends to happen now is people get referred to a speech-language pathologist only after they're having substantial voice issues. And our animal model work would say, you know what, we probably need to bring people into therapy earlier. We may need to start therapy at the first signs of voice changes or speech changes. And her work is even starting to reveal to us that it may be important to begin speech and voice therapy even prior to the onset of voice changes as a way of protecting the system or building resistance in the speech and voice system against some of the changes that Parkinson's disease can cause. So that there may be this protective component of starting speech and voice exercises earlier. Michelle's work has also shown us in animal models that starting earlier and following a very targeted and intensive voice training program may actually slow the progression of decline, not necessarily in walking symptoms, but certainly in voice symptoms. And we've known for years that intensive speech and voice therapy actually results in changes in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. So the challenges that we have in speech and voice aren't really at the level of the muscles. It's not that the muscles are weak, but that the brain is having difficulty communicating to those muscles and the muscles back to the brain relative to the amount of movement that's required in order to make the voice loud enough or to make a particular sound clear enough. And we call this a scaling problem in Parkinson's disease. So when we look at the brains of people with PD, what we see is that the brain regions involved in speech and the brain regions involved in voice are different after people develop Parkinson's disease, that brain activation in those regions is different after Parkinson's disease than it is prior to Parkinson's disease. But when we do voice and speech exercises, we can actually see a correction of that brain activity. And this tells us that even in the presence of a neurodegenerative disease, that the brains of people with Parkinson's disease are capable of making new connections, capable of producing change in the presence of exercise, specifically, in this case, speech and voice exercises. So along those lines, we want to take a few minutes to talk about what are the programs that we know work. We know that high-intensity exercise programs work. We know that we need programs that are targeted toward a specific uh, aspect of muscle groups that are impaired by Parkinson's disease. And so I'm going to talk to you about what we know in terms of evidence of four specific programs or four specific approaches to speech and voice therapy that we know are effective. And the first one and the one for which we have the most literature is the Lee Silverman Voice Treatment Program. And it's actually the Lee Silverman uh, Voice Treatment Program that has been shown to facilitate some of these brain changes in response to voice exercise. This is a highly structured, highly intensive exercise program that really targets exercises that improve voice loudness. And it involves almost creating a new habit. And that's what we think about when we think about recalibrating loudness or recalibrating this concept of effort. It's resetting the individual with Parkinson's perception of how much effort is required in order to make their voice loud enough and recreating a habit of how loud is loud enough. 
It's very intensive, typically requires four days a week over the course of four weeks, and it does require a speech-language pathologist who's actually been trained and is certified in the therapy. And this has created some barriers for individuals, both in being able to be close enough to a center that has a trained SLP, but also because sometimes it's hard to get into therapy that many days in the week. So the researchers who work on the LSVT approach have actually started thinking about different ways of delivering this therapy that might be just as efficacious but more convenient and more accessible for people with Parkinson's disease. And a couple of ways that this program has been modified and we now have evidence to support includes instead of seeing people four days a week for four weeks, the therapy can be scheduled two days a week over a longer duration of eight weeks. Now, this still requires everyday practice at home in order to maintain that key factor of intensity that we were just talking about. But it is possible to deliver this therapy with fewer days in the week and still get the same results. But I think one of the aspects that I find most exciting is that LSVT has now uh, evaluated the effectiveness of delivering this therapy online, so through a computer, either using a software program or software program plus the support of a speech-language pathologist. So it's possible that a speech-language pathologist in Toronto could work with someone who's in Sudbury. And this becomes a really important concept toward increasing the accessibility of this service. So speech-language pathologists still need to be trained, but it is now been shown to be fully efficacious that we can deliver this therapy. Matter of fact, voice therapy for Parkinson's disease is one of the few therapies in our speech-language pathology literature that is shown to be almost as efficacious when we deliver it over a computer as it is when we deliver it face-to-face. -face. And so I think this is an exciting component for us to be thinking about, especially in Canada and in other places where we have these large medical centers and then more rural communities that we serve. So this way of thinking about how we optimize access to services with people with Parkinson's. LSVT is not the only therapy that's been proposed and shown to be effective in Parkinson's disease. There are these other approaches called clear speech approaches, and Chris Jaden's work at the University of Buffalo has done a fair amount of research in this area. And different than thinking about voice loudness, this approach actually focuses on a more deliberate production of speech sounds. So thinking about making movements of the jaw that are larger, movements of the tongue that are larger, as a way of helping to produce the speech sounds in a clear clearer and more accurate way. It does not require any special certification. It is still intensive in that it requires a lot of practice. But I know for a lot of my uh, individuals that I've worked with over the course of my career, sometimes it's easier for people to think about just producing clearer speech or more deliberate speech than it is to think about being loud. And so this becomes a nice alternative therapy for people who struggle with the LSVT approach of being more effortful and being louder on a consistent basis. So one of the other therapies that I often have people with Parkinson's tell me about that has worked for them, and we do have a bit of evidence uh, in this domain, which is this concept of singing. So either singing in a choral group or actually participating in therapies that are called vocal choral singing therapies. But it's using the principles of what we know about voice coaching in a way or singing coaching in a way uh, to help improve speech and voice in Parkinson's. Now, because we know that exercises need to be specific to the muscle groups, we would expect that if we're doing a singing exercise, it would probably help more of the respiratory muscles or the breathing muscles and the breath support that we have for speech. And indeed, that is where we see the change, so that these vocal or, or singing-based therapies actually improve our breath support for speech. They do a good job of helping to reduce voice fatigue, which is a common complaint among people with Parkinson's disease, that their voice just simply gets tired when they talk for a prolonged period of time. So they do a good job of reducing voice fatigue. They do a good job of helping a little bit with loudness because they do give more breath support for speech. However, what they're not particularly good at is actually changing voice quality to a substantial degree. Now, that being said, I've had lots of people tell me that their hoarseness was improved following a singing therapy. But when we look across studies as a whole, we don't necessarily see that it substantially changes things like pitch 
or the flatness of one's voice or improve hoarseness, but it can improve respiratory support and it can reduce voice fatigue. And along this line of kind of respiratory training uh, approaches, there's a body of literature that really looks at what if we train the muscles of breathing very, very specifically. Now, one of the common complaints of people with Parkinson's disease is that they just lose their breath or they feel like they're short of breath often during activity. And if we think about the muscles that are required for breathing, this probably makes sense. The same issues that we see relative to aspects of walking and movement and voice and speech and movement, because our, our, the functions of our respiratory system are also operating with muscle movement, it does make sense that for some individuals, they might have more challenges controlling or using uh, their respiratory muscles sufficiently to support activities such as exercise and breathing. Breathing exercises have been a common approach toward helping speech and voice problems in Parkinson's disease for almost two decades now. And how they've advanced over the years is people have actually developed small devices. So Christine Sapienza's group has done this at the University of Florida, these small handheld devices that allow you to blow into them and actually systematically change the resistance in the device so that when you're blowing into it, it requires you to blow harder and harder and harder with each trial and form of exercise where instead of the, if you're exercising your muscles in your arm, you may progressively increase the weights that you're lifting in order to build uh, your muscle mass and build your strength. And similarly, this works at building respiratory strength by changing the amount of resistance required when you blow into these devices. So these approaches have been around for a long time. They have been shown to improve voice loudness, but only in the short term. They don't have long-term gains in terms of being able to maintain voice loudness in the same way that the Lee Silverman voice treatment does. They have been shown to improve cough function and airway protection, which are important components if you're someone with Parkinson's disease who has swallowing issues. But they're not necessarily uh, frontline treatments for improving uh, speech clarity or improving in a long-term way speech loudness. And before I would ever encourage anyone to engage in these respiratory therapies, it really is important to work with your physician. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease can have shortness of breath, but there are other medical concerns that can give issues with shortness of breath, such as cardiac issues and general lung issues. Uh, whether you're exercising or if it occurs when you're talking. So it is an important piece if you're going to engage in some of these more effortful therapies that you do talk to your doctor first because it might be that there's something else going on beyond your Parkinson's. So as we kind of move through and, and we're thinking about, so what is useful about speech and voice therapies in Parkinson's disease? Uh, one of the things that I would say is that we have a lot of variety of options. And so one of the challenges that, you know, we've kind of gotten this habit of pushing the Lee Silverman voice treatment. It's a spectacular treatment. It has the most evidence that we have available. But there are other options for treatments. But the important thing that we need to remember is that therapy has to be intensive over the duration of weeks and months. You have to practice on a daily basis. This really is a use it or lose it principle. Even if you have a great therapy term with your speech language pathologist, if you're not practicing your exercises on a daily basis, again, maintaining that intensity, the gains that are made can be lost. And for many people, this daily practice is a challenge. And so there are lots of ways that you can make your home practice a little bit more interesting. Uh, there are lots of smartphone apps that can help with home practice of speech and voice exercises in Parkinson's disease, setting up regular you know, interactions with family and friends where you can practice using your voice, computer programs, um, and other devices that can help support home practice. But what we know from the animal work, what we know from our human work is that practice in this case has to be there in order to not only make gains to begin with with voice and speech therapies, but to maintain those gains once you're finished with therapy. And I think probably what our new research is telling us in that hot topic way is that we should probably be considering therapy earlier in people with Parkinson's disease as voice and speech problems first emerge. And, and this is a change in practice, would require a change of how we think about uh, these exercise programs in Parkinson's disease. And I, and I think we have some clear evidence coming from the animal literature to say that we should probably be beginning therapy earlier. 
Um, that being said, however, individuals have to be prepared for variable effects. Not every therapy works for every individual. Learning new ways of speaking and producing your voice can be cognitively effortful for some people. Uh, it does not always become automatic in the way that you'd like, and so that constant focus on thinking about being loud can be frustrating for some folks. And even when everything works, sometimes our longest gains are really about a year or two in duration, meaning that it's not at all uncommon, even after you've had a successful therapy stint, to have to go back for therapy in a couple of years down the road to refresh or to reboost those skills. So we, even when we talk about long-lasting effects, those long-lasting effects are often in the duration of a couple of years. So... Current voice and speech exercise programs, though, are not the whole story, and that kind of begins to lead us into some of the other hot topics that we're going to cover today. Uh, in particular, they don't, the, our current treatments don't think about context. And one of the things that we know from the animal work that people have been doing is that the context, both the environment as well as the nature of the communication task, actually really does matter in these therapies. Uh, communicating in the grocery store is very different than communicating in a quiet environment in your home. Communicating in the car while driving is a very different process uh, than having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, the type of topics that you're talking about may also vary how well you're able to use your speech and voice, and that's some of the work that I do. And so this is a, we have evidence in the animal world, we have evidence in the human world that we need to be thinking a little bit differently about these therapies. Uh, we have the challenge of knowing that not every therapy works for every individual. We currently, the therapies that we use don't take into account thinking skills changes or language changes or the interactions among those with speech and voice. And they really don't take into account the types of breakdowns that occur between individuals with Parkinson's disease and their communication partners at what we sometimes call a dyadic level. The fact that someone's reaction to your voice not being loud enough actually goes on to affect perhaps the next utterance that you produce or how you use your voice in the next sentence. And we are starting to understand that this is important in Parkinson's disease and our current treatments don't take that into account. So we're going to talk a little bit about those as we go kind of through the rest of the talk. But a few things that I am going to raise, uh, and this is probably this notion of hearing and communication. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this. This is probably the most current and one of the hottest topics emerging in Parkinson's disease because it actually is raising the possibility for us. We talk about non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's that are those symptoms that are independent of kind of gait and movement, and it is entirely possible that hearing and hearing impairment is fastly emerging as being one of those non-motor symptoms. So as we age, our hearing does worsen, and those changes actually start about the age of 40. One of the things that can happen in uh, the presence of hearing changes as we age is it becomes harder for us to listen in noisy environments. And this occurs even if there's not a measurable hearing loss. And what we know is that even those minor changes in hearing, so what we think about as being a mild hearing loss, actually affects our ability to process speech sounds. So this figure that's on the left side of the slide in front of you is sometimes what we call the speech banana audiogram. And what it says to us is that all those speech sounds that are in that yellow range, actually people can have difficulty hearing those speech sounds and discriminating those speech sounds even in the presence of a very, very mild hearing loss. And so this is when I begin to talk to not just people with Parkinson's disease, but also their communication partners. Because if your communication partner has Parkinson's disease, their speech has changed, their voice has changed, which means that in the presence of even a mild hearing loss, you might have even more difficulty understanding them than you would someone who doesn't have Parkinson's. So this affects communication in very substantial ways. And we know that there's this interaction between hearing and cognition. So the brain has a limited amount of resources. And normally, some of those resources are allocated to hearing and to listening, and others are allocated to the rest of our functions, talking, walking, uh, thinking, memory, all of the other aspects that our brain does. 
But when we start to develop even very mild hearing loss and listening becomes more challenging, even if you're not aware that it's more challenging for you, the brain has to dedicate more resources to listening. And when it dedicates more resources to listening, there's less resources available for other functions that the brain does, like walking, like talking, like thinking, like thinking about being loud. And so we have this interplay between what we sometimes term listening effort and cognitive abilities. And what we know is that people with hearing loss actually are at a higher risk of developing dementia and cognitive impairment. And so let's talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease and hearing loss. So Parkinson's disease is a disorder that happens largely in people who are a little bit older. And so for years we thought this relationship was just maybe about the fact that older people get Parkinson's disease and hearing loss becomes relatively common beyond the age of 50. And so that was the relationship. But now we actually know that people with Parkinson's disease, because of the nature of the disruption in dopamine, may actually be at higher risk of developing true hearing loss. And this work has really come out since about 2012, uh, 2015, and 2016. There have been a couple of articles published on this. And this is both for pure tones as well as the ability to understand or discriminate speech. And we find these hearing losses even when people with Parkinson's disease would not typically report that they have a hearing loss in any way. And we're also getting some early evidence that shows that this hearing loss and hearing impairment may actually worsen in the face of worsening PD. So as your symptoms become more severe with Parkinson's disease, the hearing loss may also be progressing. So we're trying to understand exactly what this means relative to uh, the causes of this uh, additional hearing loss in Parkinson's. So we know that compared to healthy older adults that are the same age as people with Parkinson's disease, people with PD are about twice as likely to develop a hearing loss as someone who doesn't have Parkinson's disease. And so two explanations have kind of been proposed, and I'll go over those very briefly just so you have an uh, understanding of what we think may be happening, but we don't yet know what is happening. And part of that is this hearing organ that looks like a snail in the picture that's on the left side of the slide is called the cochlea. And the cochlea has hair cells that every time you hear a sound, the vibration from that sound moves those hair cells. And those hair cells then send signals in the form of almost an electrical signal to the brain. The brain receives that signal and interprets what that sound is. And that's everything from speech to hearing a siren. So the brain has to interpret that electrical signal that comes from the ear. But those hair cells are somewhat dependent on dopamine in order to function properly. And dopamine is the primary brain chemical that's affected by Parkinson's disease. And so one of these hypotheses says that the cochlea isn't working properly. It's not able to send accurate signals to the brain because of this loss of dopamine centrally in Parkinson's disease that may also be affecting some of these other structures that are dependent on dopamine in order to send information back and forth to the brain. The second theory that's been put forward is that it's not actually at the level of the cochlea per se, but this is actually at the level of the brain. So you have to remember that the basal ganglia themselves, those structures that are involved in Parkinson's disease, largely operate as kind of a gating mechanism for these signals that come into the brain from all parts of the body, also including the ears and including the cochlea. So that part of this may be a central brain dysfunction So there's not an issue with the signal that's coming up to the brain, but there's an issue in what the brain is able to do with that signal. So I think over the next couple of years, we'll see some further exploration of this topic in Parkinson's because we we actually need to understand what's happening so that we're able to make sure that we can treat uh, the challenges that we see in hearing. And so why should we care, right? Because a little bit of hearing loss, if I have to turn the television up, isn't a big deal we actually really should care because, one, hearing impairment can be managed. There's lots of ways that we can manage hearing loss, and it has such a substantial impact on communication. Remember, even very, very, very small losses can affect how well you're understanding not only important things around you like sirens and telephones, but also the voice and the speech of people who are talking to you. But here's another reason why we should care. 
which is this connection between hearing impairment and the development of dementia. So people with hearing impairment have about a 20% increased risk of developing dementia. That's even in a non-Parkinson's population. We take Parkinson's disease, which also has an increased risk of developing dementia, and we combine those factors, and we don't yet understand the relative risk of developing dementia if you have Parkinson's disease plus a hearing loss. That's some of the work that my lab is taking on now to try to understand. But it is important for us to understand because managing hearing impairment, and a few studies have shown this, that if we actually treat the hearing impairment, we can slow down the dementia or the cognitive loss that is associated with hearing impairment. So this isn't inconsequential for us to to really focus on and to try to think about in Parkinson's. And so a couple of my tips are, and I've been saying this for years when I give my talks uh, when I was still living in Canada, and I do it still here, and I'm going to say it today, get your hearing checked. And this is not just advice for the person with Parkinson's disease, but also very importantly for their communication partners. I was saying this even before this research came out, and I think what's so interesting now is that what we were observing many, many years ago was that when we would speak to uh, groups of people with Parkinson's disease, we naturally observed that there was a higher rate of hearing loss in those populations. And now we're actually seeing the evidence come forward that says that that's true. So it's not, it wasn't just kind of instinct or our observation. We actually now know that, that there is a risk for people with Parkinson's disease to have a greater risk of hearing loss. Um, you should be followed at least every two years, and you should think about perhaps devices that might make hearing and listening easier. And even in the absence, even if you're not willing to think about something like a hearing aid, it may be important to work with a speech-language pathologist or an audiologist in terms of developing good conversation habits. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those good conversation habits are here in just a minute. So kind of our third and final hot topic for the day, and this is really a hodgepodge topic. So I'm going to introduce a couple of things in this section uh, as we kind of think about uh, moving forward with some of our questions. Um, And that's relative to just really thinking about expanding our concept of communication challenges in Parkinson's disease. Uh, And so what we've already seen from what I've presented to you today and where we're really seeing this field evolve. And and I, for one, am actually very excited about this because for years we've been somewhat stagnated in Parkinson's disease to knowing that there were these communication impairments, but our interventions were relatively myopic. We focused purely on speech and voice impairments. But knowing, I think all of us who had practiced for a long time uh, with people with Parkinson's disease knew we weren't meeting their needs, but we didn't have the evidence to kind of drive us further or change our direction of focus uh, beyond speech and voice. But now, really, over the last decade, we have convincing evidence without any doubt that communication challenges in Parkinson's disease are much broader than just speech and voice. Um, and, and includes hearing, includes cognition, includes language. And this really allows us to start thinking about the possibility of different therapies at different stages in the disease. So it may be that we do intensive voice and speech therapies in the early and mid stages to Parkinson's disease, And we think more about cognitive-based or communication-based therapies in the mid to later stages. But where I'm excited about the knowledge that we're gaining on a daily basis now is this possibility that we can think about interventions and staging interventions at all stages of Parkinson's disease. It would really let us optimize communication and optimize quality of life beyond the tools that we've had available for the last two decades. I think it causes us to reevaluate best practice. If something as simple as knowing our literature on hearing loss and Parkinson's disease now fundamentally changes best practice in PD. It tells us that we should be thinking about hearing screening or audiology assessments in Parkinson's disease as one of our primary interventions and not just when somebody raises that they're not hearing well because we know that by the time someone says they're not hearing well, those deficits are already relatively advanced and that we can see hearing impairment even in people who aren't reporting hearing impairment. And that by thinking about cognition, by thinking about language, we can actually move forward with therapies that really look to optimize maintaining social relationships in Parkinson's disease, something that's very important toward preventing cognitive decline and optimizing quality of life. 
And I think one of the other things that we should be focusing on based on what we've learned in the last couple of decades relative to, to the types of services that we provide in the area of communication changes is that our technology has advanced so far in terms of use of smartphones, uh, smaller technologies, that we really should be going back to the drawing board and, in a way, building better mousetraps. We need to be rethinking about voice amplifiers and the types of devices that we use to supplement communication or to make communication easier in people with Parkinson's disease and focusing a bit more on how we can update those technologies. So we know that roughly 80 to 90% of all people with Parkinson's disease will have some changes in speech and voice. Probably 30%, and that's a conservative estimate of people with Parkinson's disease, have some changes in cognition. And this isn't necessarily dementia, but some change in focus, word retrieval abilities, uh, not necessarily memory. Uh, Most of those deficits kind of manifesting. Just a little bit of trouble focusing, a little bit of trouble changing topics or doing two things at once. That we now know that's relatively common in the early stages of Parkinson's. Uh, We know that language changes are now quite common, losing one's train of thought, excessive pausing, having trouble finding the right word. It's not just an age phenomenon. It's actually part of Parkinson's disease. And now we have this new information about hearing loss. The data I'm showing you now, though, clearly indicates that we're not doing a good job of getting services to people with Parkinson's disease who have these challenges. So this is a study that uh, I'm releasing any day now, so it's coming out probably in about two days' time uh, with Tanya Samuni's group here in the Chicago area that's looking at whether or not, uh, to what degree are we referring people for speech-language pathology services from expert care centers. So this is from five centers around the world, one of which is in Canada. Uh, And these are expert care centers where the best physicians in the world who work with Parkinson's disease are working. And at any one given time, despite the fact that 80 to 90% of people will have communication changes, we're only referring about 5% of people to speech pathology services. And we have no data on who's getting referred to audiology services. Um, So the light blue bar are people referred to speech language pathology in the graph I have in front of you. The dark blue bar are people referred to physical therapy or physiotherapy. It's a vast, vast difference in those two disciplines. Now, part of that is access to speech language pathologists. I don't disagree with that. But I think part of it also is a lack of knowledge and awareness on the variety of treatments and the types of interventions that we can offer to people with Parkinson's disease. So we can't necessarily create more bodies, but what we can do is think about training speech-language pathologists and audiologists in a more sophisticated knowledge of how to work with someone with Parkinson's disease. So that when someone's referred, our only questions aren't relative to do you have swallowing issues? and that we can actually come up with a variety of treatments that we can offer to people to improve quality of life and to improve communication. And we also need to work toward developing better therapies. And my lab is starting to try to do some of those uh, along with some of the labs of others. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in our lab. Uh, And I'll go over this briefly as well as some work that others are doing, and then we'll kind of move into the questions. But one of the things that we were interested in is whether or not uh, voice changes or intensity or pausing or making speech errors is just part of the motor changes in Parkinson's disease or whether there is actually an interaction between the ability to keep my voice loud enough and also the ability to find the right words and to express my thoughts and to put those thoughts into sentences. And so we started going about trying to explore this question in the lab. So we would have people tell stories, and then we would write down all the words and transcribe those stories and then code those stories for where we see pauses or where we see things like needing to correct the word that you use. So he went, no, she went to the store. So examples of what we sometimes call revisions. We looked for errors that might be made in uh, sometimes what we call syntax so, uh, or morphosyntax, so whether or not someone used the correct past tense ending for a word. And we looked at whether or not those occurred at random places or whether or not those occurred at predictable places. 
And so what we found was that pausing and verbal disruptions are not purely motor phenomenon in Parkinson's disease. So when people with Parkinson's disease stop and pause longer than they should in a conversation exchange, that those are typically occurring at points in time when they may also be having a little bit of trouble, not necessarily making an error, but they may be having a bit of trouble retrieving a word or retrieving another component of language planning. And this becomes really important because it shows a full integration between thinking, planning, producing words, and the ability to produce a sufficient voice, loudness, and or articulation accuracy. And what we're not finding is that people are making huge errors, but what we're finding is that the resources required to manage all of those tasks at one time is tough for people with Parkinson's disease. And we're starting to also, as we've been in this data this week in the lab, actually, we're about three weeks into the analysis on this finding, that voice loudness changes are also not random. And they're not necessarily occurring at places where people are needing to take a breath or running out of air. People's voices tend to get quieter at predictable places where they may also be struggling to plan language, such as finding the right word or finding the next word that they want to produce. And again, these aren't huge whopping someone is sitting there saying, I'm struggling to find this word. They're very subtle effects. They're subtle effects, though, that make a difference in whether or not people can really do this effective dual tasking or two tasks at one time, focusing on what they want to say, focusing on what the other person is saying to them, and also thinking about being loud. So this really corresponds to what we've been hearing for years from people with Parkinson's disease, which is, I've learned all my voice therapy, I'm doing a great job with it in therapy, but when I leave therapy and I go home and I'm talking to my family, I can't think about being loud and engage in the conversation. And so we're actually starting to show that systematic interaction in the lab. And that's leading us to think about how do we treat communication difficulties differently in Parkinson's disease. And so we've just put together this study, and we're starting to uh, uh, get in the process of kind of gathering our resources for recruiting patients for this study relative to taking people with Parkinson's disease and dividing them across multiple types of treatment, so an intensive voice treatment, a conversation strategy training treatment, and a new treatment that we've developed that looks at training voice, so typical voice training activities, but in the context of changing language demands, where we're intentionally manipulating the context of the task. Remember a few slides ago I said context was really important, but current therapies don't account for context differences. And we're starting to develop a therapy that would train the voice in these different context requirements. And we're going to see which one actually gets us the best gains over the long term for people with Parkinson's disease. So this may be more than just about making the voice better or making speech better, because that may make you louder, and it may make you able to do some tasks like single sentences and reading paragraphs, and you may be able to use those those strategies sometimes in conversation, but not all the time in conversation. And what we're really trying to do here is to create a therapy that gives people better communication all the time across multiple contexts. And so we're starting down that process now. I'm going to talk very, very briefly about some of the updates that we have in exercise and cognition. And, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about what can I do to, you know, protect uh, myself from further decline in my Parkinson's disease? How can I improve my functioning in Parkinson's disease? And this and a lot of people ask questions around therapies such as stem cell therapies, which still are in their full experimental stage. So no one's doing stem cell therapy that I know of uh, in Canada or in the U.S. on a routine basis. Um, and still today we consider that experimental. But the one therapy that isn't really experimental anymore that we know works and is effective is exercise. So physical exercise is still incredibly effective not only for improving motor functioning, but also for improving cognitive functioning. And so we have now multiple studies that show the effectiveness of exercise in PD. Um, and we're starting to actually have this thought around do different types of exercises help motor functioning and cognitive functioning differently? 
And so to this in Petzinger, and some of this, again, comes in the animal literature, where they train uh, animal models in PD to do different types of exercise, and they look at whether or not that form of exercise makes them better at thinking or better at moving. And there's starting to be some developing theories that actually kind of show that all exercise is good, any exercise is good, and the best exercise is the exercise that you'll stick with and do on a regular basis. However, there's these early emerging theories that say type of exercise might affect different brain regions differently. And so Petzinger's work is starting to look at whether or not aerobic exercise, such as riding a bike or running or walking or playing tennis, might actually have greater influence on brain structures that are used in motor movement versus sometimes what we call skilled exercises, such as yoga or tai chi, that might actually have a greater impact on regions of the brain used for thinking, planning, and even language. And in our early animal model work in this area, we are seeing just that, that skilled exercise, again, mice and rats aren't doing yoga, but skilled exercises that are similar to the requirements of yoga that we have animals do actually improve cognition, whereas aerobic activity improves things like motor movement. And so it really does uh, start to have us think about balanced exercise programs in people with PD or perhaps even some targeting of exercise programs in people with PD, depending on whether we want to improve cognition or we want to think about motor functioning. And if we want to do both, then we might want a balance of exercise type activities. So I'm going to touch again briefly on my Build a Better Mousetrap idea. Um, Scott Adams at the University of Western Ontario, one of his master's students, Monica and Drita, actually did this survey and study to figure out which voice amplifiers work best for people with Parkinson's disease. Now, we've been using voice amplifiers for at least 25 years in Parkinson's disease, and they really are intended for people who maybe can't make their voice loud all the time in all situations. It's a bit of a microphone that you wear that helps your voice to be uh, louder simply just by amplifying it. Now, one of the challenges with these devices is they are archaic. And most people with Parkinson's disease do not enjoy using them because they are large, uh, they're unwieldy and sometimes difficult to manage, and more importantly, the sound quality is often poor. So I think Scott's work is really important because it highlights for us which uh, amplifiers that people with Parkinson's disease prefer to use and which gives them best sound quality. But I don't think it takes away from the fact that for me, if we were investing dollars today, one of the places we need to invest dollars strongly is thinking about how we develop a better voice amplifier that might help people with Parkinson's disease, a smaller device that they can manipulate easily, um, and it gives a more natural sounding voice. So, But I do like to put this slide up because I think it, it gives people with Parkinson's disease and clinicians some guidance as to which devices are currently available, um, but it certainly means that we need to think about uh, more devices and better devices. So a few tips from this area, um, and then we'll move on to our questions, is it's really important to think about perhaps a balanced exercise routine. So do the exercise form that works for you, but if you are someone who enjoys doing both cardiovascular and aerobic activity as well as some of these skilled movements such as Tai Chi or yoga, there really may be a benefit in thinking about doing both forms of exercise. And it's important to stay socially active. Uh, and this is tough for people with Parkinson's disease. It can affect mobility and it can affect just how you feel about yourself in terms of interacting. But I would say that one of the most key components uh, to living well with Parkinson's disease is staying socially active. And that's because we know that social engagement actually reduces the risk for cognitive decline. We know it improves general outlook on life and mental health. And it gives you the opportunity on a regular practice on a regular basis to practice your speech and your, and your listening skills. And remember I said, it's, it's kind of a use it or lose it. And speech exercise, the best way to practice using your speech is actually to use it by engaging in conversation with others. So, you know, whether that's maintaining old social relationships with friends or creating new social relationships or engaging in conversation groups or attending uh, a learning activity of some kind or the other, it's important to really think about uh, intentionally uh, creating opportunities for socialization. 
But on that note, it's important for us to think about good conversation habits. Uh, and our conversation habits uh, that are of real importance to us are these are our strategies that we have found in our lab are effective. We've we've tried to create a bit of a study of finding out which uh, conversation strategies are best for with people uh, with Parkinson's disease. And consequently, or interestingly, there are also uh, strategies that work relatively well in people who have hearing loss. And so they overlap with those strategies that an audiologist might give you to uh, compensate for some hearing changes, uh, which we've been talking about a lot today, is, is relatively common in Parkinson's. And so they include making sure that you have face-to-face -face communication. So it is quite challenging to have with someone in the kitchen and someone in the living room to have a conversation. So it's important to get face-to-face. -face. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, there's less distance to cross over. So if the person with Parkinson's disease is having trouble making their voice loud enough, sitting face-to-face -face just reduces the distance that they have to work to do that. But it also allows you to use facial expression as well as hearing to disambiguate the message. It's also really important that you think about verifying messages. So before moving forward, that you've actually make sure you understood what somebody meant to say and you ask for clarification as needed. And you make sure you let your partner know if you're going to change topics at all. Okay? So I'll leave you with a bit of a picture of where my current surroundings are. So I sit on Lake Michigan and do my research from there. Uh, and then, Grace, how about moving into some of the questions? Are you good with that? Uh, yeah, perfect. We've got uh, a couple that came in uh, wanting to know what are some of the smartphone apps? Yeah, so there's there are lots of those that are out and available, and it's a, it's a technology it's kind of hard to keep in touch with because there are, everyone's always designing new apps for practice. Um, probably the best way to handle that, because I think it is a really important question, is maybe what I'll do is put together a list of those apps and kind of the links on where people can download those apps, ones that we've actually tried in the lab and tried in our clinical practices that we know work and work consistently, um, and maybe put that out to the audience. Does that sound okay, Grace? It's probably an easier way of handling that because um, there's lots that work on help with voice intensity and help with practice. Um, but maybe what I'll do is put those together this afternoon and you can send them out by email. Does that work? Sure. Sure, for sure. Because it's a little um, hard to show those in our current format. <laughs> but I can send those out. Another question that has come in, a very good friend of mine has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Over the years, she has gradually lost her ability to mm -hmm. speak. When we're together, I can't understand a lot of what she is saying. Any suggestions for her? Yeah, so, I mean, I, when we talk about losing the ability to speak, I think it's in, important for us to probably consider maybe why that's happening. So there's, you know, uh, and in that, and it's not to take the, the kind of runaround response, but it probably is important to have that individual see a speech language pathologist either at home um, or at uh, within a clinic, because there may be a variety of reasons why this person's having trouble with their voice. Um, it's relatively unusual for people, not necessarily completely unheard of, but more unusual for people to lose their voice altogether. Um, as a general suggestion, you know, what we find is when people are losing their voice altogether, then even our voice amplification strategies don't work as well. And it sounds like this person probably needs, um, there's a couple things a speech language pathologist could do. They could, one, see if this person's a candidate for therapy. But even if they're not a candidate for therapy, they might can help design some communication strategies or the use of alternative methods such as pictures or writing that might also help to facilitate communication. Without seeing this person, it's really hard to know what strategies might be best, um, but I think even an in-home consult would help tremendously with a speech language pathologist in terms of helping to design strategies that would work for the two of you and really help to optimize communication. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. They keep coming in. Uh, there, seems, <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be an increase in the number of hearing or check likely hearing aid providers in yeah. communities, <laughs> likely due to the aging population. How does one know to which yeah. of these storefront services to use, or um, are there any hearing loss testing agencies not affiliated with hearing aid sales? Yeah, so I can answer, and so thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, this is one that's pretty personal for me. My husband's an audiologist, <laughs> so I'm going to answer this question. I think the hearing loss, so I'm going to make a, a statement that the hearing loss that we're seeing in Parkinson's disease is probably a complex hearing loss. And so my suggestion is 
that if individuals are seeking an audiometric assessment, that they actually see an audiologist. So there's two types of frontline hearing providers in our Canadian uh, healthcare setting. One are uh, one set of those providers there are hearing instrument practitioners. So those are people who aren't audiologists but are fully licensed uh, to evaluate hearing and, and to uh, select uh, and fit hearing aids. And then there's an audiologist, and the audiologist is typically someone who has a master's degree, uh, if not more advanced training than that. And so they really are familiar with the science of, of hearing loss. Not that a hearing instrument practitioner is not just a different level of education. Certainly, there are some hearing instrument practitioners out there who are seasoned and experienced and would do an excellent job at evaluating the hearing of someone with Parkinson's disease. But my recommendation actually is that people try to seek out an audiologist. And you can simply ask. You'll know whether or not that's someone who uh, is CASOPO registered or is an audiologist versus is a hearing instrument practitioner. And I would ask that question. There's a couple reasons why. The hearing tests that we need to do in Parkinson's disease because of the complexity of that loss are not simple. They do involve speech and noise testing as well as what we sometimes call pure tone uh, testing. And the selection of hearing aids is also not simple because of the need to consider motor issues and uh, really selecting the right device that will give that person longevity. So you're exactly right. There are lots of storefronts opening up. I would select one that had an audiologist. Are there places that aren't linked with hearing and, uh, aid selling agencies? Absolutely. Um, and a good place to find those would be through an ENT clinic or an ear, nose, and throat clinic that might be near you, and also a university setting that would have a training program with an, audiolo an audiology training program. So depending on where you're living, there might be one of those clubs. Being attached with a hearing aid sales group is not necessarily a bad thing. They're still very good audiologists just to do that. But I, again, the complexity of these hearing losses, I, I would suggest at least at this stage until we get more training out there to hearing instrument practitioners that you go through an audiologist. Um, we heard you uh, speak to alternative delivery methods of uh, speech language therapy. And our next right. question says, living in a smaller community is much <laughs> different than the larger center. It is that, yeah. Most of the services are at a distance and not available in smaller communities. Does this yeah. create problems when one tries to utilize these services, especially if you're traveling with a PD individual? Absolutely, and I'm not, you know, that's something I'm, I'm painfully aware of, and, and um, you know, a lot of the work, and so I agree, and it, most of my practicing life were, was in small rural communities, and so that, you know, that challenge I certainly understand, and I think that's where, uh, and I'm empathetic to it, I think we are trying, I think Parkinson's Canada and other agencies are trying to get the message out to SLPs in a much broader scope that we can actually utilize some of these services via telehealth, um, and that means helping to create the infrastructure and some of the opportunities in these more rural communities to do that. And one of the models that we've been using in a couple of places is actually a family practice clinic. And so it may be that, we, and, and we've done this in a couple of places, where we take a family practice clinic and we set up um, a telehealth unit in that uh, practice clinic so that an SLP who may be hundreds of miles away can actually work on treating you in your local clinic, your local physician's clinic. So the physician may not be involved in that, but they provide the, the setting uh, and help support the equipment to where you may be traveling two miles instead of traveling 200 miles to see a speech-language pathologist. Um, with the advent of computer-based technologies and kind of face-to-face -face and web cameras, we can also do a lot more just with a basic home computer, but that still requires that we get speech-language pathologists comfortable and knowledgeable about how to deliver services via telehealth. I think we've got a gap there. Um, and I don't think we have any easy solutions that will be available uh, tomorrow, but I think advocacy-wise we're working toward that. But I would say that even without the specialized care, there's a lot that a speech-language pathologist can do who isn't certified in these techniques. Um, and that means, you know, optimizing things like home health services to have a, a speech-language pathologist come into your home. So I think it, it does have some limitations with it, um, but it doesn't necessarily preclude the ability to provide any services. Does uh, deep brain stimulation affect voice? Yes, yes, and yes, uh, and yes. And it, <laughs> to a certain degree, it depends on where the stimulator is placed. 
Um, and so there's a lot of literature out there uh, relative to kind of speech, not just voice, uh, but also speech intelligibility and accuracy of producing sounds. Uh, some of it post surgery can be managed with deep brain stimulator settings, so having the physician optimize the settings for both movement and walking as well as speech and voice, and, and I've been involved in some of those setting, uh, you know, rethinking those setting parameters when people come into the clinic to try to optimize both. So some of it can be controlled with the setting, um, but we also know that different sites of stimulation, so depending on where they put the stimulator, can affect voice and speech in different ways. Uh, there was a bit of a movement for a while, and I'm not sure whether or not, um, I don't think it's, it's caught broad appeal, but there were a few studies that came out saying that, you know, looking at developing parameters for testing speech and voice in the surgery suite. So just like we look for stimulator placement relative to where it stops, trimmer. So I don't know whether, those of you who aren't familiar with DDS, when people are in DDS surgery, we actually stimulate different regions of the brain and people look for where the best stimulator placement is based on how we see the brain interact with some of those uh, because people are awake, some of the, the places that, that we look for in the brain relative to uh, if I touch this region of the brain, it stops the tumor versus if I touch this region of the brain, it makes the tumor worse. So it's part of how we kind of begin to think about localizing those stimulators. Um, it's also true that, you know, we know that certain placements affect gait better than other placements. Um, and so people were playing around with, with, as well, putting a speech protocol. And so they were doing this in Montreal for a while where they were actually doing a speech protocol in the surgery sweet to also make sure that where we were putting the stimulators was having minimal impact on speech and voice. So that may be a change that comes down the road, but yeah, most definitely, depending on the stimulator setting, you can see variable effects, and depending on the stimulator placement site. We'll take one uh, last question, and we'll uh, reassure everyone that uh, we will respond to them via email. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Okay, so the last one is, if you're not going to be socially active and speak with people on a regular basis, is singing a reasonable alternative? And along the same lines is, if you don't practice your voice, will you lose it? Yeah, and I I think those are, are great questions. So singing is a great way to use your voice. As we said, it, it addresses certain components such as, you know, respiratory and maybe some aspects of loudness. So I think it's a, a great component. But the, when we talk about social engagement, social engagement does much more than just practicing your speech and your voice um, because it also engages you cognitively. Uh, and just human contact we know helps with mood and, and helps with other components that are also important to communication and cognitive functioning. So social interaction does much more than just exercise the voice. So singing might replace components of the voice exercising, but it doesn't necessarily give you the added benefits of language and language planning and cognition and and thinking as you negotiate a conversation and topics and engage with another human. Um, That being said, there are other forms that we can think about engagement. It doesn't have to be that, that you're socializing face-to-face. That socialization can be on the telephone. And so even just thinking about a regular phone call or it can be over Skype or FaceTime or some other type of, co- of computer interface. So while singing sure would be a great supplement, I wouldn't say that, that it could completely replace the benefits of social interaction. Uh, and then the second component to that was, remind me again, oh, if you don't lose it, will you, you, if you don't use it, will you lose it completely? You know, there's, there's something to be said. We all use our voice and our voice mechanisms in different degrees. So when you cough and when you swallow, you are certainly using aspects of the same muscles that you use uh, for speech and for voice. However, the less you use your voice, certainly, you know, we know this about Parkinson's disease. This would be an equivalent statement to saying, if I sit on the couch all day, will my movement be worse? Well, it probably will. Getting up and moving helps your movement to stay uh, better in Parkinson's disease. And certainly voice is something like that. So I wouldn't say you would lose it all together, but certainly maintaining good voice quality, maintaining good speech quality, uh, the more you use it, then you're putting those muscles into activity in context, and that is beneficial, just like we would say with walking. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, You've given us some great practical information. 
On behalf of Parkinson Canada, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. For more information on living with Parkinson's or to access a recording of today's webinar for future viewing, please visit our website at www.parkinson.ca. Again, if you have questions after our session, feel free to contact us by email at info at parkinson.ca or call us toll-free 1-800-565-3000. This ends our presentation. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.